Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Vessels of the Necrons. Spaceships. The World Engine. A gloriously epic and totally awesome fight between the Space Marines and the Necrons. This story is reminiscent of the glorious days of yore, when Space Marines were real heroes, Sons of Dawn, and when the enemy brought something new and ungodly to the table, the Imperium went balls to the wall and risked total failure on a crazy awesome plan. An untainted gem hidden in the annals of the 5th edition Space Marine Codex. No sight of Wardian stupidity or Ultramarine fan wonk exist here. Only awesome. Only Sons of Dawn. And now it's a battles novel. Diameter. 400 kilometers, approximately. Mass. 15 plus gigatons, approximately. Crew. 100 million crew, including 20 million pilots and support personnel, approximately. Acceleration. 0.5 gravity's max sustainable acceleration. Tell me a story, grandpa. The world engine was a planet-sized Necron space vessel that set out when the Necron Lord of the Tomb World Borsis was usurped by Necronian politics. This was written in the 5th Ed Marine Codex, mind you. Comma and the revolutionaries, presumably led by Tuskavara, took the whole Tomb World for a little joyride. They appeared in the Vida subsector at the close of M41, beginning their reign by death starring the Agri worlds of Gaius Prime and Gaius Tertio of all life using the largest gorse weapons known to man. The Imperium got its act together uncharacteristically promptly, and sent the whole sector's fleet, and detachments from 15 space marine chapters, including the Ultramarines, the Astral Knights, the Invaders, the Blood Angels and the Aurora chapter to head off the world engine at Safferhold before the Necron Punks could get any further. Now, the main problem with the assault was that the giant ball of heat reap had the Necron equivalent of Void Shield some kind of force field unique to it, it is unknown what this technology is but it is certainly not Void Shields. Comma it was apparently so powerful that not even that many ships could do anything to it. No torpedoes, no drop pods, not even Nova cannons could touch the thing. It also blocked all teleportation attempts killing the three full squads of Terminators the invaders sent to infiltrate it. All the while, the Necrons happily blasted away at the Imperial fleet, destroying and crippling dozens of ships. But then something wonderful happened. Chapter Master Arthur Amrod of the Astral Knights came to a decision. Today is a good day to die. Chapter Master Arthur Amrod of the Astral Knights decided that if weapons can't break the shield, maybe something bigger would. He brought his battle barge, Tempestus, around to bear, fired up the engines, and rammed it directly into the world engine. And it totally worked. He sent the entire Astral Knights chapter to war, now that his ship was through the shield and crashed on the world engine's surface. The Astral Knights proceeded to kick the collective buttocks of a world's worth of Necrons over a 100 hour period. They blew up everything they found in their path, yet it seemed not even that would be enough. However the Space Marines persisted, because Chapter Master Arthur Amrod had a plan. Chapter Master Arthur Amrod was going to overload the whole planet. There are two versions of this final battle. Both are epic as fuck, so we're printing them both. In the first, only Arthur Amrod and five other Marines were left standing, while the surrounding fleet continued to pound on the still impenetrable shielding while being slaughtered by the still mostly operable Gorse batteries. The team finally hit the central command tomb after 100 hours of continuous fighting. After presumably strangling Tusk Guevara to death with his bare hands, how do you strangle a robot? By popping its head off of course, and beating the sorry scrap heaped head in, Chapter Master Arthur Amrod planted melter bombs all over the command tomb, blowing it, himself, and his five remaining, finest marines to kingdom come. Because the knights had destroyed so many generators and command nodes, when the central node exploded the power couldn't regulate itself fast enough, backed up, and blew out the whole shielding array, most of the remaining weapons, and several other critical systems in a glorious chain reaction. In the second, Amrod sent all the survivors of the chapter on a suicide distraction attack, 
Meanwhile a crack commando unit made of the entire Astral Knights HQ and lead by the man himself went to plant meltabombs at the central generator of Borsis in order to release the imprisoned Setan who was powering up the entire world engine. After fighting against some crazy scary overpowered Necron Judicator, we really need a mini of him. Amrod blew himself and every Necron and Marine up at the generator, releasing the Setan who proceeded to mulch evil overlord Tut Guevara Hekimarath out of existence along with most of the engine's power systems. When the Imperial fleet saw that the world engine shields were down, in both versions, they let everything they had fly, and promptly blamed the fuck out of IT. Point is, no matter which version you read, it's fuck awesome final act of fuck you Meltabum sacrifice. With his last act, Chapter Master Arthur Amrad had both ended the Astral Knights chapter, and saved the Imperium from this unstoppable foe. Oh, and in the second version, the last Astral Knight, a librarian whose mission was to record everything in his mind so when the Inquisition found his corpse they would know what happened, vowed to the seat and the Imperium would hunt him down too, because that's how Imperials roll. The after mission report was similarly filled with win. The fleet remained in orbit for several weeks after, not because they were searching for any remaining Necrons, mind you. No, they were letting the Adeptus Mechanicus actually sift through the wreckage for useful stuff. And, the Blood Angels salvaged the wreck of the Tin Pestus themselves, towing it down to make planet fall on the recently harvested dead world Saffrahold, to raise an Imperial Shrine inside the wreck dedicated to each of the last 772 Marines of the Astral Knights chapter who fought and died to cripple the world engine. Every one of them got a personal statue inside the shrine. And despite the fact that the world is totally deserted save for only about 9 scavengers that still live on the entire planet to this day, the shrine is personally guarded by volunteers from each of the 14 space marine chapters that fought alongside the Astral Knights. Fucking. Metal. Tomb ship. At 15 kilometers across from the beam, a tomb ship is the Necron's answer to a battleship of which the Cairn class tomb ships are among one of the largest and most powerful class of Necron Grawassangs. They are the most powerful and heavily armed of Necron ships and are easily strong enough to mano on mano with an entire Imperial Navy battle group. Though they are powerful, these giant flying Grawassangs are also rare and have only been encountered seven times in the entirety of the Imperium's history. They are heavily equipped with an array of Ock weapons, such as the Sepulchre, Lightning Arcs, energy drain generators, and x borksug particle whip launchers. They are always part of a fleet and have never been seen without three escorts of Scythe class harvest ships. They are all of the same design, indicating a well planned and tested ship, brought to the fruition of its design. Though there are no known variants to the Imperials, there is a rumor that a Necron ship that dwarfs an Orc Space Hulk may have engaged an Orc fleet, although this may be typical Orcish exaggeration. Length. 9-10 km, approximately. Width. 15 km. Mass. 75 megatons, approximately. Crew. 120,000 crew, including 17,500 pilots and support personnel, approximately. Acceleration. 1.4 gravity's max sustainable acceleration. Necron Light Cruiser. Like its other contemporaries in the tomb fleet, Necron light cruisers are extraordinarily powerful ships that seriously stretch the line of the term, light cruiser. They are also quite large, being roughly 4-5 km long and around 7-8 km wide. These are big chonkers for a light cruiser and could go one on one with most races battleships. Despite their size, however, they are strangely underarmed, presenting only 3-4 weapon batteries on average. Cartouche. The Cartouche class light cruiser or the Cardouche is a light cruiser class vessel of the Necrons. Bearing a strong resemblance to the Shroud class, the primary difference between the two ships is that the Cartouche is equipped with both particle whip launchers and lightning arc arrays while the Shroud is equipped with solely the latter. This makes the Cartouche a relatively well balanced and adaptable vessel. Due to this, the Cartouche is a slightly cheaper and weaker version of the Kopesh. The Cartouche is the cheapest line ship available to the Necrons from their limited pool of selections. Besides having one less turret and two stroke three RDS of the hit points of the stronger vessel, there isn't anything really special about this vessel compared to the other. 
One point of note, if you are unfamiliar with the way the Necron weapons work, the lightning arc batteries have side angles of attack, like Imperial broadside weaponry, however, unlike the Imperials who can only fire the battery facing in that direction, both lightning arc batteries can fire in either direction, they just can't fire forward for some reason. This is fine anyways, better than being locked into a 90 degree front arc so the cartouche, along with the other light cruisers, can use broadside attack orders to stay on the move and help dodge macro shots. Length. 4-5 km, approximately. Width. 7-8 km, approximately. Mass. 24.5 megatons, approximately. Crew. 42,000 crew, approximately. Acceleration. 2.6 gravities max sustainable acceleration. Kopesh. The more expensive and premium version of the cartouche. Acting as a reserve force, fighting with the scythe class harvest ships, they are more heavily armed than the shroud class light cruiser, and very effective when used in conjunction with the shroud, taking more damage before allowing the shrouds to get in closer. Kopesh class vessels wield one particle whip launcher and three lightning arcs compared to the cartouches too. As such, the Kopesh is the toughest light cruiser, taking 1200 points of hull into the fight, giving it the most resilience in the long run when combined with its stronger armament than its little cousin, the cartouche. Like its companion, the side arcs for the lightning batteries allow all three weapons to fire in either direction so you can get your entire damage and crit output on a single target, as can the other Necron light cruisers. For the pleasure of having higher end weaponry and extra hull, you'll be paying the most expensive cost for the Necron light cruisers, and a pretty expensive price when compared to other similarly sized ships from other factions. Length. 4-5 km, approximately. Width. 7-8 km, approximately. Mass. 27.4 megatons, approximately. Crew. 51,000 crew, approximately. Acceleration. 2.5 gravities max sustainable acceleration. Shroud. Your quintessential Necron ordnance boat. The Shroud class light cruiser is equipped with a heavy complement of lightning arc turrets. They were first recorded in 992. M41 during a battle with Battlefleet Pacificus. In the following six years three more incidents ended with the Shroud class light cruisers retreating from battle. It is believed that the ship class or crew were under evaluation. In 998. M41. Five Shroud class light cruisers assaulted the Adeptus Mechanicus facility on Mars. How the proverbial fuck that these guys managed to evade the defenses of Sol, we have no idea. Several managed to land on the soil of Mars itself and although they were all destroyed in the end, their hulks were never found. Since the Mars incident, six additional encounters have seen the Shroud acting as the forward eyes and ears of the Necron fleet. They excel in this role because no ship that is capable of catching them has the firepower to engage it. The fact that five of these light ships easily infiltrated the Mechanicus's homeworld, reinforces the danger the Necrons pose to the Imperium. The Shroud takes the highest raw DPS spot and ties with crit output with the Kopesh, but does so without the significant increase to hit points the Kopesh gets. On the plus side, by having all the weapons as turrets, the Shroud benefits from having a full 270 degree firing arc across all its weaponry. Another additional benefit is the sensors upgrade unique to the Shroud, which increases its identification range and allows it to work as a spotter for the other two light cruisers longer range gorse whips, along with any other larger ships in your fleet with longer ranged weaponry. Length. 4-5 km, approximately. Width. 7-8 km, approximately. Mass. 25 megatons, approximately. Crew. 42,300 crew, approximately. Acceleration. 2.6 gravities max sustainable acceleration. Seclum. A very strange class that defies any normal classification that is more of an area denial weapon than a conventional warship. The Seclum is a new Necron light cruiser added with the release of Patch 3, along with several other Necron vessels meant to expand upon their very limited navy. While not the only faction to be light on ships to choose from, 
The fact they are one of the main campaign factions meant they were a focus for some extra attention. As far as standard weapons go, the Seclum is a significantly worse damage and crit dealer than the Shroud, considering the limited firing arc and fewer lightning weapons. The real reason to take the Seclum is because of the Star Pulse Wave special weapon. The only ship in its class to field it, the Star Pulse Wave is a devastating ability that deals 250 damage to everything in 4,500 meters of the vessel while most importantly, destroying all enemy ordnance like torpedoes and fighters. Being able to deny ordnance heavy fleets their primary form of damage dealing can really tilt the scales in your favor. Length. 4-5 km, approximately. Width. 7-8 km, approximately. Mass. 27 megatons, approximately. Crew. 39,600 crew, approximately. Acceleration. 2.6 gravity's max sustainable acceleration. Harvest ship. Harvest ships are basically the Necrons analog of either a cruiser or battle cruiser. They appear to be more common than the larger Cairn class tomb ships and have so far been part of every encounter with Imperial ships. Despite being considered in the same weight as cruisers, harvest ships are incredibly long, at least double the length of other factions cruisers battle cruisers seeing as how they are as long as a tomb ship. The ships appear lightly built compared to imperial vessels, but this is misleading as they are particularly difficult to destroy. There are only three known instances of the disabling of a harvest ship, and in each case, the firepower of several capital ships was required. They are with their armament, the equal of all but the largest of the Imperial vessels. Scythe Harvester. The Scythe Harvester or otherwise known as simply the Scythe class or Harvester class, is your bog standard harvest ship. Considered a cruiser class due to its weapons, the Scythe Harvester is a flexible and adaptable class of Necron warships. The Scythe Harvester is also where things start to get really serious with the Necron ships, both with their insane toughness and incredibly high price. At 291 points, the cost of the Harvester is comparable to battleships of other factions. Because of this, Necron fleets relying on numerous heavy ships have to be careful about being swarmed and taking critical hits to their weaponry. As an entire Necron fleet can have fewer than 30 actual weapons bays, criting them out is usually the fastest way to stop you from damaging their ships. Also like with the other Necron ships, if they decided to bring a lot of lances, you might be in for a bad day. Another Necron standard reminder is that while the on paper raw DPS might be low, always remember it doesn't have accuracy fall offs that other factions have to suffer with, and in the Scythe Harvester's case, one stroke 3 RD of its damage is also piercing both armor and shields. Like with other side firing weapons this faction possesses, all four lightning arc batteries can fire from either the right or left side, they just can't fire forward so they are not broadside weapons in the typical sense. Switching to your dispersed lightning arc when facing large numbers, making good use of your scythes and utilizing your teleport maneuver to retreat for repairs, or chasing down fleeing almost dead enemies, will go a long way in extending the use you get out of this vessel. They also have two particle whip launchers to target heavily armed ships at the front, making it an overall, balanced warship. Length. 9-10 km. Approximately. Width. 2-4 km. Approximately. Mass. 34.2 megatons. Approximately. Crew. 71,200 crew. Approximately. Acceleration. 2.3 gravity's max sustainable acceleration. Reaper. The Reaper class is an upgrade to the normal Scythe Harvester and as such, it goes from cruiser class to battle cruiser class in terms of weight category. For a 68 point premium over the Harvester, the Reaper class packs in an extra 25% damage over the Harvester due to having 6 lightning arc turrets rather than 4 lightning arc batteries, along with a comparable stat boost to its hull and, slightly less to, defenses. This mind you, is a ship that still carries the two standard particle whip launchers at the front, coming with a total of 8 weapons platforms. This is a significant uptick in points cost so it might be still worth toying around with how taking harvesters over the reaper might be of benefit to you as far as making room for an extra ship somewhere. 
If you do decide to stick with the reaper you will find yourself doing considerable damage at range with a nice wide arc for all your weapons to fire together within. Unfortunately taking more than one will eat up more than half your fleet point total and three means not enough room for even one light cruiser, forced to split the total left between a pair of escorts. The reaper takes a loss of engine speed from the smaller harvester, however, at 200, it is still comparable to some of the imperial light cruisers and escorts. Length. 9-10 km, approximately. Width. 2-4 km, approximately. Mass. 39.2 megatons, approximately. Crew. 77,000 crew, approximately. Acceleration. 2.3 gravity's max sustainable acceleration. Harrower. The Harrower class is the Necron's rough equivalent of an ordnance boat and is another one in the cruiser class weight range. It is one of four new Necron vessels added in patch 3, meant to help expand upon the selection of Necron ship hulls and give players a bit more variety and choices. The Harrower drops the particle whips to go all in on the lightning arc batteries. This means the Harrower has no ability to shoot targets in front of it, as its weapons are all locked in broadside arcs. On the plus side, since the full weaponry is lightning weapons, you can use the dispersed stance to allow the full armament to hit multiple targets, making the Harrower the better option of the two if you expect to face a more numerous enemy, while the Harvester will perform better against fewer, more heavily armored enemy fleets. Length. 9-10 km, approximately. Width. 2-4 km, approximately. Mass. 37 megatons, approximately. Crew. 75,500 crew, approximately. Acceleration. 2.3 gravity's max sustainable acceleration. Ruiner. The Ruiner class is the harvest ship's primary lance boat. Like the Reaper, the Ruiner is a battlecruiser class weight. These monsters say fuck your void shields, I am going and dry. It is the new battle cruiser added to the Necron fleet with the release of patch 3, which brought 4 new ships total to help expand the options available to players with the others being the aforementioned Harrower, the Scourge and the Sekham. With the Ruiner, you get a slight trade in weaponry, dropping some of the lightning weapons and losing the overlapping front facing arcs to double the amount of shield piercing particle whip launches brought into the field. Notably, this gives the Ruiner the largest number of particle whip weapons of all the Necron ships, even beating the Cairns 3 turrets, making the Ruiner your best and most economical way of stacking those weapons. Length. 9-10 km, approximately. Width. 2-4 km, approximately. Mass. 34.7 megatons. Approximately. Crew. 72,000 crew. Approximately. Acceleration. 2.3 gravity's max sustainable acceleration. Necron Grand Cruiser. The Krons only have one known type of Grand Cruiser first introduced in a patch in Battlefleet Gothic, Armada II, thereby making it the third faction to have access to Grand Cruisers, with the other two being and surprisingly, the Imperial Navy and the Fleets of Chaos. Scourge. The Scourge class Grand Cruiser is an ex borx Hugh carrier cruiser that wouldn't be out of place in being called a battleship if the tomb ship already exists. Whilst it is around the same length as a tomb ship, it is not as wide as the giant Kwasan. If anything, the Scourge class resembles a hodgepodge amalgamation of every Necron ship design, like some kind of Frankenstein's monster. At the very least, it looks closest to a harvest ship, albeit, Heavily beefed up. Due to being a carrier, the Scourge is the only Necron vessel to have legit launch bays and a set of four at that. Now it can only launch the same hull damaging Doom Scythe fighters that the other Necron line ships can, but can actually launch large groups of them instead of single squads only. On top of that, since it still possesses the Doom Scythe transfer ability the other Necrons use to launch their fighters. You actually have a whole 5th squadron you can launch separately, with its own set of 3 charges. This makes the Scourge the only vessel in the game to be able to launch 2 separate squadrons at 2 separate targets at the same time. Other than that, it has 6 lightning arc battery weapons. Whilst that may sound a lot, for its size and its price, it is a bit underwhelming. But that is to be expected for what is, for all purposes, a carrier. Length. 
9-10 km, approximately. Width, 7-8 km, approximately. Mass, 50.1 megatons, approximately. Crew, 86,300 crew, including 10,000 pilots and support personnel, approximately. Acceleration, 1.8 gravity's max sustainable acceleration. Necron escorts are nothing more than large, flying croissants. Resembling the smaller Cronsaint flyers like the Night Shroud, Necron escorts are still more than a match for most races ships. There are only two types of escorts known and both are classified as raiders by the Imperium. Dirge. The Dirge class raider is the smallest vessel in the Necron fleet and the smaller of the two known escort classes, the other being the Jackal class raider. It appears to be somewhat rarer, although this may be due to the relative scarcity of encounters with Necron fleets. For armament, the Dirge class raider is equipped with three lightning arc batteries. They are believed to be the ships encountered before the Yuktan incident and the first known Necron harvest. In 692, M41 a layer of impenetrable metal was encountered under the ground of Angelus which turned out to be a ship that rose out of the sands and left rapidly. It was likely that the Angelus boat was the first Dirge class raider. One thing to point out immediately of the Dirge is that it's incredibly susceptible to assault actions. Yeah, it has a great morale bonus but only having 6 troops is harsh even under the best of circumstances. Without the shields other factions possess, this means you are also always in danger of being lightning strikes, meaning the range at which the Dirge can be turned into a drifting hulk quickly is larger than you might normally expect if you've played other factions mostly. Now the counter to this as also pointed out in the stats above, is you are getting a ship that matches the other fastest destroyers in the game. So if you need a ship to cap points behind enemy lines and zip away before they can catch you or chase down kiting vessels, the dirge is a good option. If your enemy decided to bring a lot of lances, however, while bad news for Necrons in general, the weakness of the hull means your dirges are going to pop off like little cyberpunk fireworks. Length. 1 km, approximately. Width. 2 km, approximately. Mass. 9.2 megatons, approximately. Crew. 14,000 crew, approximately. Acceleration. 3.2 gravity's max sustainable acceleration. Jackal. The much bigger Kwasong and the Dirge's bigger brother. Jackals are the equivalent to Imperial escort vessels, specifically frigate class, and have been encountered several times. Only on two occasions have these ships been seen working on their own. Instead, they are usually found tailing the Cairn class tomb ships and Scythe class harvest ships. It is the larger of the two escorts, the second being the Dirge class raider, encountered as part of the Necron fleet. For armament, Jackals wield four lightning arc batteries. The Jackal seems to be the best option in its weight class considering for just 5 extra points you have a ship that's twice as survivable with better troop defense and trades the 25% speed boost for a 33% damage and crit chance increase from the dirge. Considering the lack of shields that is such a factor in Necron fleets, the extra hit point seems well worth the cost in the long run. One thing that hampers both of the escort ships. Perhaps more so with the Jackal considering its combat orientation, is the 90 degree fire arcs that force you to use head on attack orders. If you were able to have a wider arc that permitted broadside circling, it would help in dodging shots. This is offset by the fact that lances are your biggest concern anyways and moving about isn't going to save you from 100% accuracy, armor piercing light beams. Length. 1 km, approximately. Width. 3.5 kilometers, approximately. Mass. 11 megatons, approximately. Crew. 19,000 crew, approximately. Acceleration. 3.1 gravity's max sustainable acceleration. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, 
The succubus that has poisoned the towns well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Landships. Aeonic Orb. A rare and ancient piece of Necron artillery, the Aeonic Orb is a floating construct built during the war in heaven to counter the forces of the old ones. This ungodly beast of a weapon is to a monolith what a monolith is to a scarab. Why is this thing so hoog, one might ask. Because, my friend, it has really hoog guts. The main weapon on the Aeonic Orb is, in fact a fragment of a star. Not just any star, mind you, the star in question is typically stolen from a particularly disgraced or hated race or kingdom solar system, relinquishing the planets and remaining population to fly off into space, frozen and dark, coasting forever. Keep in mind the Imperial Guard, and lesser militaries, face this thing and still win. 40k folks, it's batshit insane all around. Height. 25-30m, approximately. Mass. 15 kilotons, approximately. Crew. 0-3 crew, approximately. So what is this orb of unstoppable rape and carnage? To put this in detail, the Aeonic orb itself is merely a container for the star fragment, which has been heavily compressed using spatial and dimensional manipulation and modified via the addition of fresh hydrogen and removal of waste elements from the big ball of fiery death, making it a small ball of even more fiery death. Other systems include solar energy collectors on the inside of the star chamber to collect enough energy to power all of the various systems, drives, and functions of the orb. The containment systems keep the star both contained, big surprise, and mobile, as well as isolating the gravity field of the imprisoned star to, you know, stop the thing from imploding the Aeonic Orb and any planet it sits on. It floats along the ground much like a monolith, but at a higher altitude. Since GW never released an official, or unofficial, model for the thing, nobody knows quite what it looks like. Maybe it is camera shy. Or kills all witnesses. Probably the latter. Either way, it is big and somewhat circular. It has no other weapons besides the star. Oh, wait. Did we forget to mention the star fragment is the main weapon? Because it is. This monstrosity uses a part of a star as a weapon. You see, the containment field on the Aeonic Orb can be breached on command, releasing all of the power and fury of a literally unchained fusion reaction in any direction it chooses. Plasma wishes it was this cool. Not only do you get a blinding light, a burst of raw plasma, and a heat so searing that magma starts to look like ice, you also get a blast of every conceivable kind of radiation, meaning that if by some miracle of miracles you survive your stellar experience, you will probably have no totally intact strand of DNA left in your body, and literally every organ in your body will fail, get cancer, lies, and or boil. Not always in that order. It can fire in a solar flare or solar burst. The former is designed to pierce the heavens and burn through any defense, even the earth itself, sublimating all matter with impunity, in what can only be described as a continuous, beam-like explosion. The latter is designed to bathe infantry and vehicles, turning the area inside the blast into an inhospitable hellhole of heat and radiation so intense organic life boils and pops like a balloon if not already instantly burned to hot ash, while tanks melt like butter into hot, gooey slag. The only caveat is that the star powers the containment field, so the Aeonic Orb must stop and recharge after each shot or risk a total solar breach and release a supercharged, super compressed star onto the battlefield, permakilling Necron, foe, the entire planet it was standing on and severely fucking up the whole star system with its gravity in short order. Which brings up an interesting point. There is no way to defend against this rape machine. Consider, the Imperial Navy gets its hands on four Blackstone Fortresses, or planet killers whatever. Even if they were able to breach the armor of the orb, the fragment could resume its original dimensions, swallowing part of the planet or fly apart in a sort of mini nova and kill everyone. Even in the mild, resume normal size scenario, the gravitational changes in the solar system following the escape of the star fragment from the orb would but fuck even Jupiter-sized planets in the system. Those planets that didn't get swallowed would be launched into interstellar space. 
The only way to destroy it without getting destroyed is to use warp weapons in order to send the sun to the warp and let the demons burn instead. Which would still be quite a story breaker since only the Imperium, the Elder, technically the Orcs, and Chaos have warp weapons, and Chaos itself won't be keen on sending such a massive amount of energy into the warp. And of course, nothing this awesome could be made by GW. Thank you. I was always rather proud of it, even an epic scale where the rules for it were released. Necrons rarely, if ever, draw upon the Aeonic or Bin battle. It is considered a critical resource by current Necron forces, and only in an all-out war will they send this death machine to battle. And let's be fair, the Necrons haven't faced an all-out war since they gobsmacked the old ones. If you do decide that you have to make an apocalypse entry for this thing so that you can use it in your army, the Enogon edition of Unicron the planet eater in planet form is perfect, well, assumedly. Nothing else in the universe is probably a better estimated match than this grimdark void manifestation for ages 3 and up. It's a big, black and green death orb of planetary destruction. It even has little scarab pincers and an opening to its interior that can clamp open and shut. If you have a Necronomy and don't already own a Unicron action figure, get one. The only way this Transformer could be beat is if the official release for the Aeonic Orb is as big as your typical playing board, unlikely, but probably to scale. Aeonic Orbs in classic sci-fi. In classic science fiction there exists an even more awesome parallel called the Nicole Dyson Beam, marking perhaps the first time that something in 40k isn't the most extreme example of what it's supposed to represent. A Nicole Dyson beam directs the energy output of an entire star towards a specific direction, which can be used to move entire stars, aka a Shkadov thruster, or incinerate a distant planet from light years away. In fact, very serious people have had very serious discussions about one of the solutions to the Femi paradox is that the first civilization in a galaxy to reach sufficient level of technology to build such a thing would use it to eradicate any other technological civilizations that may one day rise to challenge its dominance. Abattoir. The Abattoir is a Fukhug Necron vehicle and is arguably considered as the largest Necron land vehicle to date. Bigger than the Aeonic Orb, Crypt Stalker and even the fucking Megalith. All shall shit bricks when this thing goes to town. The abattoir is so fuckhoog that imperial forces actually have mistaken it for a goddamned Necron building. In fact, a recent review of imperial records now indicates that the abattoir may have been encountered on six separate occasions before it was understood exactly what it was. If there ever was a Necron Titan, this would be the closest one would get without getting into scub territory. Height. 27.2 meters approximately. Length. 54.4 meters, approximately. Width. 54.4 meters, approximately. Mass. 45 kilotons, approximately. Crew. 1500 crew, approximately. Once called world harvesters by the elder, and for good reason, because abattoir means slaughterhouse. One must wonder what the world engine was actually called. Abattoirs are more building than vehicle, and have been responsible for the destruction of many worlds and civilizations. During ancient times these pyramid-sized constructs were used when slave races could not be transported to the temples of the Setan to be sacrificed. Unlike most Necron units and vehicles, the abattoir does not have phasing capacities, instead it has to be brought to a world to be deployed on site. This is generally done by a rapid deployment ship like the Scythe class harvest ship. Once on the surface, it walks around, supported by tentacle-like limbs that are deployed from its capacitor sub-pyramids. This makes it look reminiscent to the flying spaghetti monster which would be hilarious if it wasn't for the fact that this thing dwarfs a megalith. The abattoir is the largest known Necron ground vehicle and is of similar displacement to a goddamned Imperial Warlord Titan in size and tonnage. Essentially a large floating city, it has recently been postulated by imperial theorists that an abattoir forms the hub of the wheel which is a Necron's teleportation network. Like most Necron units, the abattoir makes heavy use of gorse weaponry, although its armaments are much stronger. An abattoir's weapons not only flay their victims where they stand, but also harvest their pain and fear at the moment of death creating a stored source of sustenance for the captured Setan to nibble upon like some sort of strange pet. In addition to these weapons, 
It carries massive swarms of scarabs inside, normally used for maintenance purposes. They can also be deployed offensively. There are no actual official abattoir models, but that doesn't stop some people from making one. Megalith. Megaliths are monolith and doomsday monoliths father and is thus very large and very powerful. Megaliths are enormous mobile fortresses, in fact, they are so large they can carry multiple monoliths within its hull, releasing them like a swarm upon the battlefield like a giant necron matryoshka doll so you can shoot gorse cannons while you shoot gorse cannons. Other than its humongous, humongous what? Comma size and capability of carrying as many monoliths as possible, the megalith is also equipped with an arsenal of devastating gorse and particle weaponry far more powerful than your standard issue monolith. The megalith is fully capable of space travel as well as planetary landings, and is used to initiate full-scale planetary assaults against hardened targets, usually from planetary orbit. A megalith was first encountered by the forces of the Imperium of Man in the hands of Nemesis Andrek, a Necron overlord of the Sortek dynasty, during the conquest of Atta Prime in the Vida Sector in the late 41st millennium. At Atta Prime, Zandrek's megalith and its related forces were responsible for eradicating three regiments of the Imperial Guard's elite Catachan jungle fighters and three full companies of Imperial Fist Space Marines. Suffice to say, the Imperials got their asses kicked and were sent home crying that the big meanie Zandrek had stolen their lunch money and took them to town for an ass hoopin. Ever since this incident, the Imperium has stayed the fuck away from Zandrek's megalith. Height. 25-30m, approximately. Length. 25-30m, approximately. Mass. 22 kilotons, approximately. Crew. 50 crew, approximately. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the not a fiction bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.